Um, today we're going to talk about satellite TV technology. Um, this is going to range everything from, um, let's see, we're going to, louder? Okay. Is this better? Okay. We're going to talk about everything from huge dishes down to small dishes, from satellite internet service to, um, you know, encryption, decryption, uh, NagraVision, Dish Network, DirecTV. Just going to try and go through a lot of it very, very quickly. Um, at the end, we'll have a little bit of a question and answer. And um, afterwards, if you want to ask me some questions, just meet me out by the pool, I guess. So, okay, we'll start. All right. This section is where I'm going to sort of describe how a channel from CNN, ESPN, gets from their broadcast location to your home via a uh, home service, such as uh, Dish Network or DirecTV. And sort of by explaining this diagram, this model, it'll help you understand um, how the home services work. Okay. So first, what CNN does is they have their new station in Atlanta, and they send their signal to a satellite, Telstar 6, on Transponder 22 at 93 degrees west. Um, the location of the satellite is given in degrees away from the Greenwich Meridian, and this is because all the satellites are located along the equator, so there's no point in having north-south coordinates. Um, the symbol rate is four mega symbols per second. The forward error correction is set to three fourths. All this stuff I'm going to go over, but I just want to familiarize you, you know, the terminology. It's 93 degrees west, and this is just what I went over. The Greenwich Meridian. So, all of the major communication satellites are located on the equator, and what happens is they're on ge geosynchronous orbits, so they're basically stationary in the sky. And this allows a home user or anybody using one of these services to point it once and never have to deal with it again. And a common misconception is that the big dishes are for tracking the satellites as they move. While there are some that can do that, the vast majority of them are only for um, geosynchronous satellites. And here's a video to sort of demonstrate um, how a dish would move across the arc of satellites and see as it slowly moves, it moves in an arc from one horizon to the other. This particular one will, uh, in, in the span of it moving across the sky, will cover about 40 different satellites in this, you know, 50 second clip. Um, the major satellites, there's about 10 home satellites that use, uh, um, that are used between DirecTV, Dish Network. Um, they use a circular polarity, which is different than the, the other satellites, and we'll get to that in just a second. Okay, a transponder is actually a combination receiver and frequency converter, and then a, a transmitter package. And what happens is a, a satellite will uplink at a certain frequency that's different than the downlink frequency. And this is done to prevent um, interference on the on the uplink and the downlink. So when they uplink the signal, it's sent as a direct stream up to this satellite at a very, very specific location. And then it's sort of beamed back out um, along a footprint. So DirecTV, Dish Network, they all have a footprint that covers the continental United States. The footprint for other satellites may be as big as a city. Um, they can do this by using spot beams and different technology. And this is to illustrate the point of the uh, polarity. The polarity is, a, is kind of odd. The vertical polarity and the horizontal polarity is the most common used type of um, polarity method among like broadcast technology because it's very, very easy to implement and it's cheap to make. But the DBS services, they use a circular polarity. And this is done to prevent interference. At the same time, it's kind of weird. Um, it's, it's completely non-standard. They're the only basic services that use it. And so it's really sort of difficult to deal with. But they do it because terrestrial interference um, happens all the time because the surface waves from the Earth, when the Earth moves, they have a vertical polarity. And so they mess up a lot of the satellite communications and whatnot. Not on a regular basis, but when they do happen, it's, it's bad. And another problem that they have with circular polarity is the rain fade. The vertical and the horizontal polarity is not as prone to the rain fade, which is why they use it for 
the uh, TV distribution, like of channels and stuff, because it's just way easier to deal with during rain, sleet, snow. Okay. Symbol rate. This is a. Uh, this is going to be a little tricky to explain, but it's basically the bit rate of the transmission. Um, this is oversimplifying it a bit, but basically, if any of you know the difference between a baud rate and a bit rate, the symbol rate would be the baud rate. You can send so many symbols per second, but it corresponds with how you modulate that that symbol rate to turn it into a bit rate. So, if we're talking about um, something like DirecTV or Dish Network, and they use um, QPSK mod modulation for sending out their video, then they can put two bits for every symbol, which therefore increases their bit rate from you know whatever they use times two. So, if they use four mega symbols per second, now it's eight. And the forward error correction. The forward error correction operates on an assumption that errors will happen. And errors do happen all the time. Um, and it's really, really inefficient. Um, so normal network transmissions, you can request for more information to be sent whenever there's a problem. The uh, broadcast mediums have a problem in that the uh, receiver cannot request information. So they send out a error correction with every single um, bit of information. So if there's three bits of stream bit, stream data, there's going to be one bit of error correction. That's what the three fourths correspond to. If it was five six, then it would be five bits of stream data and one for error correction. So now we're at Dish Network and DirecTV, and what they do is they take the stream, they decrypt it, they decode it, and they put it back into another stream, which is then multiplexed and sent up after it's encrypted. The only difference between these two, um, between the, your sort of home services and the, the services that they get is the encryption method and the number of channels per transponder. This particular CNN feed, which goes to Dish Network or DirecTV, operates on one transponder. So, and then you have the home services, which operate on, they have many channels per transponder. So the bit rate's going to be lower because they have to smash in more stuff in less space. And after they encrypt it, then it's sent up to the satellite. Okay. And then they have a they have a Nagravision, which is very, very common in Europe. Um, EchoStar uses it. EchoStar owns Dish Network and Bell ExpressView. The uh, it's somewhat secure, although uh, many people have hacked around it. The actual encryption method is quite secure, but it's the uh, the smart card and how they authorize the stuff that's actually uh, quite um, insecure. Uh, the transponder 16, that's actually just not even relevant. Um, I'm just doing this to sort of familiarize with the terminology again. The frequency is 12.443 gigahertz, and all of your receivers know this information. They don't have to, you know, search out and find it, or you don't have to specify it. And this operates within a DBS band. DBS band is just those home services. They operate within a specific frequency range, which is 12.2 to 12.8 gigahertz. And the symbol rate's 20,000, 20,000 kilosymbols per second. Now you're thinking, whoa, wow, that's that's great. It's way higher than what we just had. But if you keep in mind, we're putting six or seven video streams, six or seven audio streams, satellite internet service, some system information streams. I mean, it adds up quick. So, I mean, you end up with 15 streams within that one symbol rate, and so you end up with a much lower bit rate. And keep in mind, this is the symbol rate before the error correction. So if we have 20,000 kilosymbols per second, then it's going to be 40,000 uh, megabits per second, and then you chop off a fourth of that, you're down to 30. So effectively, you only have 30 megabits per second to work with. The forward error correction is 5, 6. Service ID basically corresponds to the channel number. Um, the video packet identifier and the audio packet identifier, this is a very, very hard topic, but I'm going to sort of breeze through it. It basically, your, uh, your, inf your information streams have a whole bunch of information as to where everything is, sort of like CNN's video is here and CNN's audio is here, and it knows to put those two together and put them into a stream. Um, it receives all this information in various, through a series of other acronyms, but we won't get into that, um, through program access tables and stuff like that. 
Um, I'm, I am going to make one specification here that the uh, information from this slide forward is going to be DVB specific, which uh, Dish Network and Bell Express View use, but DirecTV uses their own called DSS, which has a different uh, length of packet and these weird technology that it's not compatible with anything. Um, let's see. So, what happens here is you have your home system. Uh, you have uh, receivers that contain conditional access modules where your smart card goes. The smart card holds the keys for decrypting streams. So when a stream comes in, it goes to the conditional access module. The conditional access module goes, do you have a key for this stream? The stream goes, yes, I do, and here you go, and decrypts it. Now, whether or not something goes through the conditional access module depends on whether or not it has a certain header within the, the packet itself. And there's something called the transport scrambling flag, which is a little two-bit piece of information at the beginning of each packet, and it specifies whether or not it should go to the CAM and then ask for a key, or just go to the CAM and then go on to the decoder and uh, the DMUX, um, the multiplexer, which separates the audio from the video. The, uh, the funny thing is, is that you can, uh, you can get PCI cards that, have, that can operate with the same functionality with a uh, hardware CAM module. You plug it into the PCI card, and then you plug in your smart card, and you program it to get your channels. Um, this is done mostly in Europe. It's barely catching on in America. There is software to emulate the conditional access modules. Um, several different types of, of cards exist. The main ones are the hardware and the software. That's sort of the main difference between the two. Hardware, hardware PCI cards, they have a hardware MPEG decoder in them, so they can decode the stream just as it comes in, and they don't have to use any system resources to, to decode them. The software ones, on the other hand, rely on the system's power and capabilities to decode the stream. Um, <laughs> one of the uh, cooler tools that you can use with this program shown here that I have the picture of, it's called ProgDVB, and it's basically just a software receiver. It operates with PCI DVB cards. And one of the plugins that I threw in the uh, CD-ROM packet there was a plugin where if you specify the um, packet IDs of a satellite internet service provider, you can get, you can download everything that anybody is receiving through their satellite internet service. And it dumps everything onto your hard drive. And you can set it up to filter for file names or by file size. So, um, but the only problem is that a lot of the people that use satellite internet service, they live in rural locations, so it's lots of porn. I don't know if it's a problem, but <laughs> well, it's a problem if you want to get any information off of them. So, and yeah, well, yeah, a lot of passwords that fellow said right there. Uh, the destination IP and the MAC address are also stored with each file. There's a DEX file that saves it too, so you can see whether or not who it was going to. I mean, it's a. I don't know why why they wouldn't encrypt it, but it's just silly because people are stupid. Uh, free-to-air stuff, we'll go over that now. Uh, free-to-air channels are basically done to provide, uh, let's see how we can say this. People want weird channels, basically, and they want them for free. So what they do is they send them to satellites, like, uh, yeah, there's some pretty funny ones on here, such as this one, which is a very, very brief listing of uh, free-to-air channels on Telstar 5. We have the... Um, Rang a Rang TV. We have the um, the Overture, the Jam E Jam, and we have the Jesus Satellite TV, which is fun watching. Um, as you can see here, the coordinates for it. I'll explain what all these mean. 97 degrees west is how far over it is, so you know where to point your satellite dish. The KU band is what it operates in, which is 11.7 to 12.2 gigahertz. Um, this means that you can use one of your smaller dishes, not like your home dishes, but you can get away with a, maybe a 35-inch dish instead of, you know, a 10-foot dish. Um, vertical polarity, the polarity is specified there, and then the name of the um, channel there. And then the uh, at the end there, this is actually the symbol rate of that particular transponder. 
it's not the symbol rate of each channel. But some of the other stuff that people often want to know about is um, C band because they often hear lots of rumors like you can get pre air you know TV shows before they air in uh, uh, the US and it's true you can uh, pre air primetime network TV shows are sent to Canada without logos and without commercials because they have contracts to air them in Canada and so they overlay their own you know, commercials and their own logo so they send them to Canada first and what you can do is tune into these because they're unencrypted sent just right over the airwaves no one cares because basically they're they're kind of lazy and the system works now so they don't want to change it so if you're willing to set up a you know 7.5 dish or a 10 foot dish you can watch alias or you know whatever show you like before it airs um, if you see here here's a little guide that I've partially pasted from a URL that I have at the end uh, 24 which is a popular show it pre-airs at 1.30 a.m. my time because I'm from the Mountain Standard Time or 3.30 a.m. On, on the East Coast on Tuesday morning now it airs Tuesday night so you can get it 15 hours in advance and they um, all of these go through I mean all of them have you know ranges that go from two hours to 72 hours in advance and it's kind of phenomenal that even such a thing exists because with today's TV, you know, technology, they're just they're fanatical about keeping their copyrights and whatnot. But then they send this stuff unencrypted before anyone else has access to it. This is often how spoilers for episodes get released. Now, tips for getting equipment: KU band equipment, which we just talked about, the free-to-air stuff, 60 centimeters, 120 centimeter dish, 18 inch to 45. Um, that's basically the size you'll need. The LMBF and feed horn with the horizontal and vertical polarity which they use is going to require um, I don't know it'll cost you maybe 40 bucks 30 bucks receiver set top box or DVBS card can cost you about 100 bucks maybe 200 total cost about 250 new for basic setup and you can legally set these up even if you live in a, a homeowners association area because the uh, laws basically say you can own up to a one meter dish um, legally even if even if their laws say you can't you can because the FCC regulates that the C band equipment on the other hand if you live in a homeowners association area you probably can't uh, 7.5 dish to 12 point uh, 12 foot dish is normal preferably mesh because a wind resistance is a big problem the the wind resistance against the the dish often will snap them uh, hurricanes in Florida and the southeast will just tear through dishes very very easily the uh, LMB which converts the downlink frequency um, these are all just the different parts the skew motor controls the feed horns polarity and the actuator moves the dish so the actuator was that device moving the dish as it went across uh, the, skew mo the skew motor knows when to switch back and forth so if you have your receiver set up to at this certain location I want it to go to a vertical polarity because that's what the satellite is then when you move the dish and it sends a signal to switch it to that polarity um, the analog receiver set top box that's what most of these uh, pre-air feeds are um, if you're interested in that sort of stuff a few of them are digital and then even fewer of them are digitally and encrypted uh, none of the analog ones are encrypted which is what most of them are total cost it'll cost you about a thousand dollars to uh, it says 2500 but I mean, some of the stuff I've seen, maybe 5000 for a basic setup. Or you can go on eBay, which I did. I got my entire setup for 100 bucks, with including everything, including a receiver that's $900 new. Because people don't know what they can do. They basically just throw them away. It's like, we're going to take it to the dump, but we'll sell it on eBay. So you can get them for really, really cheap all the time. Um, same with the KU band stuff, although not as cheap, because people still use them. So not quite as obnoxiously big. Uh, here's some other links that we're going to go over. The North American Free to Air Channels, good guide. Digital MPEG information. Um, Mr. Video's Wild Feed List, which that was a partial showing of. It has just tons. I'm talking about like 300 shows there that um, feed. I mean, it's not just new shows. It's also syndicated ones. So you'll get 10 airings of Jerry Springer in a row in one night, which is just really annoying. <laughs> 
Um, DVB forums is a good place if you're interested in that file grabber. Um, I'd definitely check out those forums. They have a section for it. Uh, or progdvb.com, which is the guy who wrote it. Uh, Dr. Dish's Satellite Espionage, very, very interesting link uh, because he basically goes through different stuff that he's done with satellite dishes and how he's um, picked up spy satellites and all sorts of really, really, really cool stuff. The, uh, some of the stories that in include um, how one would file a fake tax return in, in, one's, in another person's place via satellite from, from Europe um, and get their check. Uh, this is really <laughs> kind of questionable. Uh, um, basic broadcast information there at the bottom. And uh, of course, it greets to the SLC 2600 crew and Geek Syndicate. And I want to know if anybody has any questions. Your question? Talk a little bit more about how response rate works. I know you haven't talked much about DSS, but uh, it's okay. about. Uh, the question was um, sort of to go over spot beams um, because DirecTV has been rolling them out and Dish Network's been rolling them out too and how they work. Um, basically what happens is the signal sent up to the satellite and the spot beam um, focuses its, its power in one particular area. So they have a certain type of radio that they can point in a certain area. The one that they have for their um, nationwide coverage is much more powerful and has much more broad um, sort of uh, broadcast area. I don't know exactly how to say that, but um, the spot beams sort of, they're just the same, just focused in a certain area. They don't operate any differently. Um, is there anything else? Okay, the question was... Um, So I want to know how far it's been sort of widespread used. Yeah. Okay, the question was how, how widespread is the spot beam use and, you know, what app, who else uses it and what applications sort of apply to that? Is that right? Okay, so um, spot beams are used just for the regional coverage stuff. There isn't a whole lot of nationwide stuff that they would only use in spot beams. So it's mostly just local channels and stuff. Um, some spy satellites use spot beams because they're, good at keeping other people away from the information. The, uh, some weather satellites use them. Um, other home services, like uh, DirecTV, they use them. Dish Network uses a few of them on some satellites, but there aren't, it's not, I wouldn't say that it, a ton of them use it, but um, anything you want, unless it's local channels, you can get on the other satellites. You have a question there? Oh. <laughs> Um, I'm thinking, uh, he wanted to know how, how tight the spot beams go, how close of an area. The, uh, the spot beams can operate within about, well, the one on the east coast that you're sort of wondering about, it operates from basically D.C. to New York. There's a spot beam for, I'm, I'm thinking of Dish Network right now. Um, I don't know about DirecTV, like their particular spot beam, but the Dish Network one op operates within that entire area. So... Is there something more? Okay. Um, you have a question there. Is there, is there any uh, information about the uh, HD streams? Yeah. Okay. His question is about the HD streams. And yes, there is information about them. And the PCI cards that we just went over, um, in software mode on the hardware cards or the software cards themselves, they can decode them. Um, the HD streams themselves, you can find information about them uh, on that forum, forums.dbbnetwork.com. Um, the DirecTV ones, of course, they use non-standard stuff, so it's much harder to um, use them unless you buy their equipment. The, the, Dish, the Dish Network stuff's a, bit, a little bit more compatible with other technology. So the HDTV stuff, there is information about it, and most of the stuff is located on satellites on the, on the coast, so they're not located on the main ones in, in the middle of the sky at 110 and 119.
in laundry mats? Was that? In a, in a laundry mat, right? Is that what you said? All right. So his question was, how does a smart card different from the P3 to the P4 on DirecTV, which they use, and the smart card they use in a laundromat? The difference between the DirecTV cards and the one you use at the laundromat, hypothetically, um, they're basically just different types. They have different ways of storing the information in the layers. So the, um, like, you know, Dish Network uses one that has about 50 layers within that tiny little chip, and it has that information allocated to be certain, you know, areas within each one of those layers, and so that they make they made their own conditional access modules to access just that type. And the one you use at the laundromat is probably very very generic, you know, compatible with a lot more variety of applications. The difference between the P3 and the P4, the P4. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know tons about it, but I don't think anybody does. Some people do, but I don't. Um, the P4 basically has a built-in routines that if you try and mess around with it or if it thinks that you're trying to mess around with it, it'll kill itself. So is that the same as what a GS? He wants to know if that's the same idea as what the... Uh, so the the SIM cards using the GSM phones? I have, I don't know. I don't own any GSM phones. Okay. Yeah. So he basically just sort of clarified um, something there that this fellow had a question about. The uh, the ones at the laundromat, I mean, assuming they're very generic type, will just store information. And the ones that DirecTV uses have routines built in to, you know, deter um, people from messing around with them. But that's, that's sort of the major difference. Well, I mean, it, it is, and it. Right, 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 and and some of them have don't have routines built in to destroy themselves. They just have, but there are several that just operate as storage. Right. Yeah. He basically just said that the laundromat just has a little database of how much money you have left, and yes, they all do within a have CPU and in RAM. So yeah, smart cards. The legal implications of messing around with that stuff, you go to jail, fool. <laughs> right, but... Uh, yeah, so basically, if you mess around and decrypt someone's signal and they didn't tell you to decrypt it, you have just violated the DCMA. So... Speak up. Camless IRDs. Yeah. Yeah. They're cool. <laughs> um, camless IRDs basically are receivers that don't have a sort of tagged um, conditional access module with a certain ID so that you can mess around and change them as, you know, Dave's blacklist gets updated. So, um, whatever. I, I don't know anything about that. Sorry. 
He wanted to know if I played much with Starband. The previous guy's question was whether or not I dealt with SCP, SCPC, single, single carrier per channel, data services. Um, I don't know a, a whole lot about them other than the SCPC would be a single carrier per channel. means that it operates just as one stream on a, on a satellite. And uh, what was your question again? It's Starband. He wants to know if I've ever messed around with Starband or any information about it. Um, Starband, the, I'm assuming you mean the, the internet service? Yeah, internet, the internet service, Starband, um, there's lots of information out there about it. Um, I assume you can use the file grabber program in conjunction with Starband. Um, can you say that again, please? Oh. What's the difference? They aren't telling, yeah, I don't know anything about the, the star band because I, I live in a metropolitan area and I don't need satellite internet service. But the, uh, I'm, I don't know. The star band stuff is, he, he was basically just asking what the difference was between different model numbers. So anyone else have any questions? Okay, go. The direct TV stuff, direct TV stuff again, not my you know forte, so I don't know. I I mean I would, I could, you know bullshit something, but I honestly don't know. Oh. Two-way satellite stuff, um, basically the you know, direct way and stuff like that. Um, they just have a very very small, well low power, um, transmitter, and then a, also just the normal feed horn. And they operate sort of in the same way that a home satellite's, you know, TV setup works, but just with a, also a transmitter package uh, on there. And they're sort of allocated a certain bit of information uh, on a certain stream, so they're allocated just, you know, a tiny bit. Is there any sort of limit as the number of dishes that can to a satellite? No, because it, it operates as a broadcast, so it's. It's basically like throwing confetti. I mean, anybody can grab it, and it's like just unlimited. So, go. Um, well, it's it's governed by um, network policy. Oh, he was asking if there's any limit to the uh, to the power in the in the bit rate that you can operate at. The uh, the bit rate you can't sort of hack and get more upstream. I mean, you can have a stronger signal, but could you overload your neighbors? So, um, you could overpower their signal, but you wouldn't end up getting more bandwidth, per se. So, shoot. Yeah. Um, probably the Hop Hog Nexus S. Um, they run you about 220 bucks, and they have the hardware MPEG decoder. And they're compatible with just about every piece of software out there. So, how are aggressive are dish networks anti-piracy? Is sort of how are they going to come after you? Is that what you want to know? Um, from what I've sort of seen, Directv um, like will kill you and then dish network sort of won't they don't really there it seems like there's two different sort of policies direct tv is to sort of hit everybody over the head that's at, you know stealing service and dish networks is to just get more subscribers it seems like dish network probably doesn't care as much i mean if i had to if, if i had to say so sure Yeah. If that was true, why would the DirecTV be using such heavy-handed tactics right now? If we're not that close, or if it hasn't already been done? Preemptive, just to scare people. I mean, he wanted to know why Dish Network, or I mean, DirecTV cares so much about the P4 and their new, um, their new cards. And I said, basically, just it's to scare people. Go uh, in the blue shirt.
the fact that they think that they're uh, he wanted he was basically just saying that the direct TV um, has basically a less um, fail safe and sort of secure or they have a more secure um, Dish Network is more secure. They're, they feel that they're more secure about their encryption sh system, which is, I, I, I don't agree, but, I mean, the the reps aren't that smart then because the, uh, the, uh, the I mean, DSS, or the video guard, which they use, is just, it's really, it's it's a pretty secure cr encryption system. It's just how they do the authorization at DirecTV that's all messed up. And Dish Network, they're, they use a very, uh, just sort of mainstream Nagravision. I mean, people, people in Europe have been messing around with Nagravision for years. So, the uh, I, I don't agree that that the Directv is necessarily you know less you know secure than Dish Network. Um, in the green shirt. So you, you want to know why they don't send out the, the instructions to wipe the cards more often? So why don't they send out the, uh, um, the sort of list to make sure that you can't get service? Why don't they do that more often, the ECMs? Yeah, why don't they send them out more often? Probably because it takes a while to update the information. Probably takes a while to get more data on which ones need to be um, updated and to, before they can send out the streams. Um, DirecTV s seems to send them out quite often. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're insane, so. <laughs> how, much, how much of the bandwidth is actually dedicated to the ECM when they go on these all-out ECMs? Like, how much video are we losing? Oh, none, because it's all sort of in the system information table. You're losing very, very little. So you wanted to know um, about sort of larger scale events like sporting events and maybe conferences that are sent via satellite if they're um, encrypted or, you know, experienced with them. Um, a lot of the video conferences and news feeds and stuff are not encrypted. They just don't deal with it. Uh, sporting events are, typically, with the exception of maybe um, a few uh, Formula One races or something. But on the whole, like Sunday NFL games, they're always encrypted. So we want to know if if the stations sort of control what's encrypted and not encrypted. So if everything is everything Fox sends encrypted or is everything NBC, the actual encryption and, and decryption is controlled by the production studio and not the station. So if it's Warner Brothers Studio that's putting it out, they'll go through a, a digital provider called CVC and they will use a digital uplink and they sort of pick and choose which ones Warner Brothers will, that they want encrypted. You know, Friends usually is and uh, West Wing will be, but um, all the other ones typically aren't. Um, the other sort of different ones, Fox, ABC, they don't encrypt them. Um, only stuff that comes through Warner Brothers is is encrypted. Okay. So he wants to know if DirecTV and um, Dish Network both use the uh, author the the keys on the in the conditional access module for the decryption. Yeah. No. 
what it does is it, it acts as a receiver where you can tune the information on the uh, PCI card. You want to know if there was any, if you can just automatically decrypt Dish Network using one of these PCI cards. No, you can't. It enables, the new thing that came out with Dish Network enables you to not cross-reference the key. Yeah. Not cross, okay. So to put it on another card or device, is that what you're saying? The camless stuff? It, it doesn't have anything to really, the camless, is that what you mean? The camera stuff doesn't really apply to the PCI cards because you can automatically program the the cam ID on within the software. You can say, take this cam ID. But you'd have to get your receiver out and you know hook it up and to get the cam ID off of it and or you know get it off the, the card. So to hook it up. So he wants to know about sending the movies to the movie theaters via satellite. Um, I don't. I, I think it's kind of a rumor because I've never seen anything about it. But it, they might have done it back in the day, but I don't think they did. I, have, I haven't heard anything about them do it. About Lucas Films? If, if they do, it'll be encrypted using PowerView probably because it's, it's pretty secure. So he's... So it is coming. There are Lucasfilms is going to deliver it via satellite. All of them. Wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he's basically said that the Lucasfilm is going to send their information out to the movie theaters. Movie theaters are going to store it onto a digital um, box that. They can control what plays where with a digital projection system. Um, I haven't heard anything about it, but interesting nonetheless. Anybody else? All right. Cool.